first thing in the morning. Hello, I'm Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome. Thank you for coming and thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your music. Thank you for taking charge when I couldn't make it until just after two. Five people, huh? Kind of felt like old days, huh? All right. Well, I am glad to be here with you today. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read all of chapter 6 and we're going to read verse 1 of chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 1 of chapter 7. All right, are we there? Everybody ready? Here we go. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. I'm going to read the whole thing. So, For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next year. Right now, right where you are. Verse 3. We put no stumbling block. And this is Paul writing. Paul and his companions. This is a second letter to the Corinthians. He had already written to them once. Things are getting a little better. But there are still some issues there and some people who have some problems with Paul and his ministry. And he's telling them, you have to just guess what's going on. You, you, we don't have the letter from the Corinthians to Paul after the first letter. So Paul is responding to a letter, probably. And we can guess, we can assume from the context here that probably some of them are saying, well, you don't know what we're going through. Could be something like that. All right, so what, what's going on here? That's what's going on in, verse, let's start verse 3 again. We put no stumbling block in anybody's path, anyone's path, so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Hallelujah. Yeah, boy, we better get some amens and hallelujah just reading this word. Wow. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Verse 14 and following. And this is where most of our message will come from today. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship, and, or what fellowship and, can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and the devil? It says filial, but this is what we're talking about. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And for that reason, verse 17, Therefore, come out from them and be separate or holy, 
says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, I believe is part of this. I think the writers got it. The people who put these chapter divisions there made a mistake here. Since we have these promises, the previous two verses, dear friends, let us purify ourselves. And he's saying it again, what he just said earlier. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence or respect for God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, you've been speaking to your body for weeks about holiness, about separation. We've sang the songs. We've called out to you to be a body separate unto you. We want to serve you in a powerful way. We want to live for you. Now, Father, take your word and cleanse us. Take your word and change us. Father, move upon us. Let not one of us go out of this building the same as we came in. Father, change our lives today for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I have neglected and run away from preaching this word for a while because it deals with me too and it's hard to preach when God is yelling at you hey I'm talking to you <laughs> it's sometimes difficult what do we say what does Paul say here let's start in verse as I said the, the main part of my message will come from Verses 14 and following. Whew, I'm warm. I ran up that hill. <laughs> I was asked several times to do a wedding for a young couple. And they couldn't get, the, get it scheduled on Saturday because of his work and because of her hospital visits, etc., etc. And they asked and asked, and I said, well, I don't do them on Sundays. And they said, please, we want you to do it. So that's where I was at 1 o'clock doing a wedding for a 21-year-old couple. Ooh. So, hmm. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Let's look at verse 14 following. Again, let me just reiterate, Paul is responding to the church at Corinth and the believers there and saying, open up your hearts. You know, we're, we're doing all we can. We're doing it for God's glory. We know what you're going through. We've been through it. We're going through it. And then in verse 14, he says, Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there with Christ and the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreements? is there between the temple of God and idols. For we are the temple of the living God. And so on. And then in verse 17, Therefore come out from them and be separate, says Paul. No, it says, says the Lord. Be separate. In other, word, be, in other words, be holy. Be holy. Now what is this? What is separation? What is holiness? What is God talking about here? The word separation, or holy, has different meanings to different people. A good def definition from a dictionary that puts it simply, it, it means to be set apart. To be set apart. Um, some, some places in scripture it's called sanctify. The concept of separation has nothing to do with an outward act. It's really an act of the heart. It's something that happens inside. There are some groups that we think about as separate. A good group would be the Amish, right? They don't use electricity. They don't use buttons. They don't wear certain clothes. And they're separate from 
regular believers and regular non-believers, they're separate in a way because of their outward appearance, and we know they have chosen to separate themselves that way. That's not the only meaning, though. It not only means separating yourself from evil, it has a second purpose. It means separating yourself unto God. Okay, two parts to separation or holiness. Separating yourself from evil, separating yourself unto God. Right? So you can do just one and not have the other accomplished. And that's what we're looking at here. Are there examples of people who lived holy lives in the Bible? Ah, plenty, plenty of them. Let's just take a, a, a trip in our mind with Paul. How about Paul? Did he separate himself from his old lifestyle once he got saved? Big time, right? What did he do? He was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee. He lived the law. He knew it completely. He was a man of the word. He was an Old Testament theologian. He was a killer of Christians. He advocated their death. One day, he got saved, and his life turned completely around. And he separated himself from what he used to do, and he separated himself completely unto God. Paul was a perfect example of that. A few weeks ago, I preached about a man in the temple. I mean, in the, who was in the uh, graveyards, right? He was out of his mind. He was wild. He was running around. He was naked. He was dirty. He was clean. He was a follower of no man. As a matter of fact, people ran away from him. Jesus delivered him. Jesus saved him. And where do you see him in the next moment? Completely changed. He's not naked anymore. He's clothed. He's not running around anymore. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's not chasing people away anymore. Jesus is now sending him to tell his family what happened to him. So he's no longer a follower of evil deeds, he's a follower of God. So he's separated from the evil and separated unto God. And that's what, it, that's what we have to look at, both of those definitions. Separated from evil and unto God. What are we to be separated unto? God and godly things. And why? Why are we to be separated unto God? Why are we to be holy? Why are we to be unique in our thinking, in what we do, and how we do it as Christians? Why? Anybody have any idea? Why? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. I think Chris and I point to this verse every two or three months. If I don't, Chris does. Isaiah chapter 6, verse, verses 1 through... Isaiah is writing, of course it's his book, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, and you've got to guess why they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Is God holy? Yes. And what are we encouraged to do in Scripture? No, what are we commanded to do? Be ye holy, because I'm holy. The scripture tells us, be separate. I'm sure each one of us as a Christian, when we have witnessed to somebody, have said, our God is unique. Our God is not like other gods. He's special. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And so, his followers are to be unique too. We are to be special. We are to be separate. We are not to be as we were before God changed us. 
We're to have different ideas, different concepts, different ways of thinking now that God has changed us. What happens when we compromise? And that's the key, I think, in all of this. Being separate from the world doesn't mean just staying away from other people, just hanging out with believers all the time, not doing anything with non-Christians. That's not what it's talking about here. That would be impossible unless we all became monks and went up on a mountain somewhere and sat on a rock and did nothing useful. And even then we'd probably have some problems. We'd probably get sick of each other. I don't know. That's not what it's talking about. But when we compromise with evil, we're in trouble. And that's what Paul is talking about in verse 14. When he says, don't be yoked with unbelievers. And let me tell you what Paul had in mind. Remember I said a few minutes ago that Paul was an Old Testament scholar. He knew the Old Testament well. I think he was thinking about Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. It's a very short verse. Turn with me there. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. Very simple. You might think I lost my mind when you read this. Here we go. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Is that the right verse? Yes, that's right. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. This is a two-animal yoke. We all know what the other word for donkey is. I saw some of you smiling. Paul may have had this in mind. Let me tell you why, being from a farming community, it just don't work. The animal that is designed and trained to do all the work will not influence the other animal that is not trained to do all the work. Guess what's going to happen? The animal that's trained to do the right work is going to start following the other animal. Now, I don't know if Paul was thinking that deeply about it, but chances are pretty good. They're going to drag you down. They're going to begin to influence you. They don't have the same goals in mind as you. Don't be unequally yoked with people who don't have the same concepts in mind, the same goals in mind, the same desires in mind, the same God in their heart as you do. Don't be unequally yoked. What happens when we compromise with ungodly thoughts and deeds, things that are contrary to this word, contrary to God's will? I think that sometimes, and I've heard this and I've complained to others about this, that my prayers seem to be just going up into the air. Where's God? Why are my prayers being answered? Why isn't God listening to me? God, where are you? Why don't you hear me? And yet, in the deep recesses of my heart, I know that maybe somewhere along the line there's something I'm not letting go of. I've compromised with an ungodly thing. And I'm holding on to it. God, I've given you everything. This, this one. This, what happens? Turn with me to Psalm 66, verse 18. Turn with me to Psalm 66, verse 18. Now this is a psalm of victory. Let me not mislead you. It's a psalm about how David's encouraging people to shout to God and how God comes and rescues him. But David says right in the middle of that, a very important truth, if I had cherished sin in my heart, if I'd held on to it, 
if I'd have kept that sin in my heart and not given that over to God, if I'd have compromised with evil, the Lord would not have listened. I believe it, the language could even be the Lord can't listen because darkness and light can't mix. When you're talking to God and you've got sin in your heart and you're holding on to it, you're cherishing it, you're compromising with evil and you're going, God, give me. God, help me. God, bless my ministry. God, save my friend. And you're holding on to something in your heart. You're defeating the purpose. You're restricting God. Oh, a restriction on God? I can't even imagine that. Well, God has set up restrictions on himself. One is that God is not going to write up in the sky how for people to get saved. He's not going to write gospel messages up there. He's chosen to use you and I to send out the message, to be messengers of the gospel. Of course, the Holy Spirit does the work as we go forth, but he's chosen us. That's one restriction on God. But look at those five rhetorical questions in this chapter in 2 Corinthians. Let's go back to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. There are five questions that Paul asks. And it should be obvious to us. I'm not getting a lot of amens. I can see some ouches out there, but it's okay. It's all right. It's okay. <laughs> Let's start. Now, let, let me just explain something. Look, look at your Bible as you listen. Let's divide this word really well here. Look what Paul says. Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Okay, now move, don't, add, don't read after that, move down to verse 16, the second part of that. Do not be yoked un together with unbelievers, for we are the temple of the living God. Okay, that's the thought he's continuing. Why not? Because we are the temple. Okay, don't be yoked because we are the temple, all right? But in between that, he asks five questions. I hope somebody at the Church of Corinth didn't write him a letter and answer it, because these are rhetorical questions, questions that everybody knows the answer to, right? Let's ask. Let's answer. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Nothing. Thank you. Okay, next one. Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Nothing. All right. Or what, uh, or what harmony is there between Christ and Belial, or the devil? Do they tie, do they hold hands? It's not yin-yang. You know what yin-yang is? Right? You know, the black circle, you know, that you see on some karate or kung fu clothing. It's a, a black swirl with a white dot, and a white swirl with a black dot, it means in every... It's harmony. In every evil, there is good. Every good, there is evil. Baloney! That's not what the Bible teaches. There's no harmony between God and the devil. None. Zero. Okay? That's not Christian teaching. That's an Eastern lie. Okay? Eastern religious lie. All right, let's go. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Spiritually speaking, nothing. Nothing. What agreements is there between the temple of God and I? If you want to bring in some of the, you want to go up on the hill to, next Sunday to make our service really fantastic, let's go borrow a, some of the 10,000 idols up on Mitaki up there and bring them in here and fill up the church. Maybe we can make things more spiritual. No, no, nothing. We don't have any common with, anything in common with that. Right? None. None of that. Why? Because we are the temple of God. As God has said, I will be with them. I will live with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. All right. It's quiet here. One commenter wrote about this principle to not be unequally yoked. This is what he said. Do not form any relationship, whether temporary or permanent with unbelievers 
that would lead to a compromise of Christian standards or jeopardize consistency of Christian witness. One more time. Don't form any relationship, whether temporary or permanent, with unbelievers that would lead to a compromise of Christian standards or jeopardize consistency of Christian witness. And why, he goes on to say, because the unbeliever doesn't share the Christian standards, sympathies, or goals. You might be kidding yourself. Well, he likes me. We get along. He's coming to a place of understanding. He's almost there. She knows what I'm going through. No, they can't. Until the Holy Spirit enlightens them, they will never understand. Until they come to a place where they say, Jesus, I surrender, and the Holy Spirit comes into their lives and changes them, will their mind be illumined to understand what you're doing. Another pastor, not a commentator, but a pastor put it in a simpler form. We try to do that. He said, God called us to be in the world, but not of it. We can't avoid evil. Evil is everywhere. But we must never compromise with this evil. We mu must not, cannot agree with it. We cannot support it, and we cannot participate in it. We must move from being workers of evil to being tools of righteousness. Amen. Huh? That's why God is saying this. This is what he wants in your life and in mine. I believe that the lack of holiness in the church today could be the greatest or at least one of the greatest restrictions to the work and will of God today. Why aren't we full? What is hindering Mitaki from growing and bursting at the seams? What is keeping mountains from being packed with God's people when we go out there on Monday night? What is keeping our Bible studies from having people wait outside to get inside? I believe that it's a lack. One of the reasons is a lack of holiness. And we are, you are, I am, restricting God's work when we're compromising with evil. Mm. You see why I didn't want to preach? <laughs> <laughs> oh. what are we going to do if we obey this word let's continue let's look at verse 17 the solution is right here God doesn't Paul doesn't the Holy Spirit doesn't knock us around and not give us a solution it's not what it is well, what do I do God this is what you do. Come out from among them and be separate. Touch no unclean, unclean thing, and I, listen, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You will be my son. You will be my daughter, says the Lord Almighty. God cannot fellowship with you as he desires to if you are compromising with evil. He can't. But if you separate yourself, if you touch no unclean thing, he'll receive you. Yes, it's time to fellowship again. You've all had friends that you've had rifts with. How good is that? When you finally go, I'm sorry, brother. Yeah, me too. Hey, let's have dinner together. And that fellowship is restored. It's wonderful. It's heavenly, isn't it? That's what God wants. He wants that fellowship to be restored again. Are you lacking power in your life and you've been wondering why? <laughs> it's impossible. Let me give you just a few suggestions. Just three. I think we can find these in the Word. Be honest with God. Be honest. It comes from David. Psalm 51. Whole slew of them. God, you messed up. I'm stupid. That's why you saved me. That's why you came. I'm a jerk. But I'm your kid. 
Help me out. Nothing wrong with that kind of prayer. Be honest with God. Do not compromise. Do not negotiate with God. Don't bargain with God. Don't deal with God. I mean, deal with him, but don't make a deal with him. It doesn't work. Be honest, straightforward with God. Number two, evaluate your life, your walk, against this and against your brothers and sisters. Talk to your brothers and sisters. Say, hey, I, you know, I've got this thing. What does the word say about it? Don't go in search of somebody who's going to agree with you about this sin. You can find somebody who's going to say, yeah, it's not bad, don't worry about it. If you look hard enough, you'll find somebody who doesn't take this for what it's worth, and they'll, they'll go along with you. Find somebody in this body that believes this word, sit with them and say, this is what I'm dealing with. Why? And the third one, okay, got it? Number one, be honest with God. Number two, evaluate with the word and with your brothers and sisters in the body. Number three, stop it. Stop it. Cut it out. All right? What does it say? Don't touch the unclean thing. doesn't say don't play with it. doesn't say, you know, it's okay to play with it for a while. Don't touch it. Sunday school story. Sunday school teacher said, Hey, does anybody here know what repentance means? One little boy said, Yeah, that means being sorry for what you've done. And the Sunday school said, Yeah. The Sunday school teacher said, Yeah, it's pretty good. One little girl in the back said, Hey, teacher, it's more than that. The little boy turned around and gave her a pretty dirty look. The teacher said, okay, what, what, go ahead. She said, I think it means sorry, being sorry enough to stop doing what you were doing. That's what biblical repentance is. Being sorry enough to cut it out, to stop. Are we living a separated life? A separated life, separate from evil, separate unto the Lord, is the mark of a Christian. It's not a pious, holier-than-thou attitude, thinking, oh, I'm great, I'm better than you. We all know that we are not better than other people. That's why we're here. We messed up. It is a willingness to be set apart from sin and set apart for God's service. Got it? Set apart from sin and set apart for the service of God. That's what it's about. God has commanded us, commanded us to be holy because he is holy. If God were not unique, if God were not separate, if he was not holy, he wouldn't make that demand of us. We wouldn't be following him. But he's commanded us. And if we're to have any influence, any power in our lives, in our witness, we must be separate unto him. We must be. It's not a choice. Oh, that's, that's old-fashioned. I won't follow that. How can we do it? By yielding ourselves to him. By filling ourselves with the word of God. And choosing to be what God wants us to be. And not avoiding chapters like this one, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We can't do it on our own. I know that. But we can do all things through Christ. Let's pray. Father, we know you love us as sons and daughters because you have given us this lesson today. You don't love us with a love that will not chastise. You have a love that spanks. And we thank you, Lord, that you 
are putting us back on the road you would have us go. We don't want to compromise with evil anymore, Father. We're sick of it. We want to be totally, 100% committed to you, to living godly lives, so that our witness will be powerful, so that our witness will be life-changing. Let us not look only to ourselves, Lord. Let us not just pray, me, me, me. Let us pray and reach out and live so that others will be changed for your glory. Father, let us be separate unto you and separate from sin. Let us yield ourselves to you, Father. Father, then fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we'll shout the glory down and not be harboring some filthy thing in the deep corner of our heart. Lord, we can't do it without your help, but we know that we can do all things in Christ because you strengthen us. Go with us. Change us. In Jesus' name, I pray. I would encourage you as we sing to spend some time alone with God. If there are things in your heart that you need to get rid of, don't go out of here with them. Leave them in your seat or bring them to this altar. Come up here and make a place for, your, for yourself. Move wires around. Move chairs around. If you need a place at the altar, here it is. Or turn around in your chair and spend some time with God. Pull those cushions out of those pews and bring them up here. Get on your knees. Get on your face before God if that's what it takes. But don't leave that thing in your heart that is hindering the power of God, that is restricting God from working in your life. And then you're wondering, why isn't God, well, you know, my prayers? I don't want to preach it over again. But you know. I don't know. You know. Don't touch it. Cut it out. Repentance. I'm sorry enough to quit, Father. Take this nasty thing away from me. Help me to kill it. I don't want it anymore. I want you. I don't want what you can do for me. I want you. I don't want what you can give me. I want you. It's not about me. It's about you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. 